So first of all, I've been uh, been involved in, in cancer research uh, for probably 30 years and in lymphoma research for most of that time, really focusing on malignant lymphomas, uh, which include non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, Hodgkin's disease, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and uh, bone marrow transplant. And what I've seen over the past 30 years is how this field has evolved uh, primarily uh, with sort of a beginning of an understanding of the molecular biology of the diseases that we're trying to, uh, to try and understand and trying to battle. And it's really been, I'd say, in the past maybe five to ten years where I think we're going to begin to see an inflection point in uh, the progress and the rate of progress that we're making, not only in these diseases, but in other diseases as well. It so happens that the lymphomas are one group of diseases where progress has been maybe a little bit more rapid because we have access to cells, we have access to tissues, and we begin to we can begin to decipher uh, what the genetic code is for these diseases and how to uh, and how to sort of uh, attack it. We're beginning to understand the pathways that cause cells to grow more rapidly, that cause lymphoma cells to proliferate more rapidly. And by dissecting those pathways, we can look for specific drugs or molecules that might inhibit the growth of the lymphoma cell. So, you know, while we still rely on chemotherapy, um, and we understand that chemotherapy can be curative in, in many patients with lymphomas, we think that the future is going to be either new agents that are targeted to specific pathways or those new agents uh, kind of uh, working together with the agents that we have. So one example of that uh, has been the use of the drug rituxan. So it, it probably in the, I'd say in the late 80s, early 90s, people started recognizing that there's a protein on the surface of most of the cells in patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And that protein is called CD20. And it was then recognized that um, you can make an antibody against that CD20 protein and uh, hopefully uh, kill the cell, kill the lymphoma cell. And that turned out, uh, fortunately and very gratifyingly actually to be true, uh, in the laboratory first and then in the first clinical trials that we were involved with uh, in the early and mid-90s uh, when we started giving this new drug, which was ultimately called uh, uh, rituxan. Uh, it was initially called uh, IDEC C2B8, actually. It had a code name for it, uh, but it was eventually called rituxan, and uh, we started using it in clinical trials. And I'm still seeing some of those patients that were in the initial trials in, the, I'd say, the mid-90s, maybe 92, 93, 94, um, when we used this drug rituxan, and it wasn't called that then, but we used the drug people were getting pretty dramatic responses. And then uh, subsequently, we started using that drug together with chemotherapy, uh, with what was a standard chemotherapy regimen at the time, and uh, are still seeing people in remission, you know, 25, 20 years later. Um, so uh, 20 years or more later, actually. So uh, that's very gratifying to see that. And now we know that rituxan, there's hardly a patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma today that wouldn't have rituxan as part of their treatment, um, either uh, in the beginning or as maintenance treatment or if they have a recurrence for recurrent disease. And that's really made a huge impact in the way we approach these diseases. Now what we're looking for now are new rituxans. We're looking for new molecules that might um, do the same thing uh, or hopefully do it better. So. There are now uh, being developed at least two new versions of rituxan, rituxan um, that we're hoping are going to be uh, better. Uh, one is something called ofatumumab, which is already uh, on the market and that's available. And there are studies that are going on with that drug. And there's another drug that's being developed by Genentech um, that we hope will be better than rituxan. We'll wait and see. Um, our research search is designed is really focused on lymphomas 
and um, we are currently in the process of putting together a grant uh, to the National Cancer Institute uh, that is a collaborative project and the overall goal of that project is very simple. It's to improve the outcome of patients diagnosed with lymphoma. That's the goal of the grant and that's the goal of our research and we're doing that by trying to uh, sort of break down barriers uh, and those barriers uh, in the past have been uh, interdisciplinary barriers, barriers between oncologists and basic scientists and pathologists and biostatisticians and bioinformaticists and uh, uh, information technology people and chemists and we're trying to get all those talented people, all those people together working on one goal. And it turns out that that process of getting everybody together is uh, actually an amazing process and it results in uh, much more rapid development of ideas and uh, than we could do any, in any way alone. And the other barriers we're working on are geographic barriers. I mean, we're not just working with people at Northwestern. We're not just working with people in Chicago. Uh, we're even not just working with people in the United States. We're working with people around the world uh, who are interested in the same thing. So in this particular grant, we have collaborations with people in New York, people in uh, North Carolina, people in California, people in Texas, um, and uh, are have developed four projects uh, that we think are, each one of them are sort of attacking a different aspect of, of lymphoma. One in diagnosis, uh, one in understanding certain pathways. Uh, three of the projects are going to involve uh, new treatments for patients with lymphomas. Uh, one of them will be a project that will help us with the diagnosis. Uh, an accurate diagnosis is really the, the cornerstone, is the key to, to all of this. And so one of the projects is devoted mainly to getting a better diagnosis, a better distinction between certain types of lymphomas. So, um, you know, I think that that process is, the process of putting it together is, is exciting because even if this grant doesn't get funded and most don't get funded, uh, we have the synergy of the people working together to make this all happen, and so that's that's already resulted in uh, in some I think major advances and some new things that are happening. So um, I think that as we go forward with this, we're going to need the support, uh, and we're happy to partner with the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation to uh, to make this happen because the seed money for these research projects. Are, is critical. We, we can't get started unless we have some funding to do some of this stuff. Um, and we, you, you can't ask uh, organizations like the NIH for funding unless you've demonstrated you can do the work. And the only way we can demonstrate we can do the work is to have the funding. And so we have to look for philanthropic organizations, fundraising organizations to help us do that. Uh, and that's, that's what we're so excited about and, and, and working with uh, Scott and Charlene's organization. Um.